Hi, we're Talhas and Gia, and yes, we're actually siblings. For some years now, we've designed and built projects, and sometimes we make a video about one. But this one is different. During the last few months, we've been working on a crisis ventilator for invasive and non-invasive ventilation. The engineering isn't very complicated, but we realize the real issue is in the number, as in the number of ventilators. Because the potential is so enormous, the potential impact of a global crisis ventilator that is designed to be produced by the hundreds of thousands and that can be made affordable enough to be a game changer to help prepare us here in the rich countries for future COVID-19 waves and beyond, but also for the more than 1 million children dying of pneumonia each year in the less fortunate parts of the world and for millions of other patients. But the most fascinating aspect is that for once, there's one subject where everybody's interests align, whether you are rich or poor and wherever you live, for your hospital to have enough ventilators available when they're needed for you or the people you love is crucial. We'll talk about our ventilator design later in the video, but first, please bear with us for the bigger picture. There are seven types of coronaviruses infecting humans. Three of those seven have popped up in the last 17 years, and this trend is unlikely to stop. Epidemics and pandemics have plagued humanity since antiquity. The difference is that today we can fight infectious diseases and win big time. There are so many success stories. Back in the 1960s and 70s already, a coordinated global vaccination effort managed to completely eradicate smallpox. Polio is almost eradicated. The WHO and organizations like the Gates Foundation are doing amazing work in this area. The most striking thing about recent medical progress is its pace also in areas of infectious diseases, like COVID-19. New technologies are massively speeding up the development of vaccines and other treatments. It's no question that we will ultimately win this fight against COVID-19 and other new diseases that will come after it. But our scientists still need the time to develop the weapons. And the world's doctors need all the tools that we can give them to save as many patients as possible until we get there. Yet the COVID pandemic has highlighted that all across the globe, we didn't have enough personal protective equipment and ventilators. That has cost thousands of lives. PPE like face masks and gowns cost only cents to produce. Production capacity has already been ramped up massively and that has to continue, and it will, because PPE is a lucrative mass market. But in a world more than two thirds of the global population on mobile electronic devices, we don't have enough ventilators so people survive a serious infection. Not even in highly industrialized countries in Western Europe. That destroys lives and families. And pliage sounds as elegant as most other French words. But when it means forcing doctors to decide which one of two or more lives they can fight for and who they can't give that chance, there's nothing elegant about that. It's simply inhumane. Other doctors don't have to make that choice because their hospital in a developing country doesn't have any ventilators. If their patient needs ventilation, they simply die, just like that, again by the thousands. Only not just during pandemics, as in industrialized countries, but all the time, and it's often children because they're particularly susceptible to respiratory diseases. There's one crucial detail that's often overlooked when we talk about COVID-19 and ventilation. During the outbreaks of novel coronaviruses close relative SARS and MERS, the share of infected people requiring ventilation was more than five times higher than during this pandemic. In this regard, we are really lucky with COVID-19, as crazy as that sounds. Less than 5% of people infected with novel coronavirus need ventilation. But that low percentage already completely overwhelmed the ventilation capacity in many countries. Now imagine a five times higher number. So the world needs ventilators. For richer countries, we need ventilators to build up much larger emergency stockpiles. For emerging countries, we need ventilators to massively increase their availability in hospitals. And for developing countries and humanitarian crisis situations, we need ventilators because they're virtually non-existent. Why is that? The answer is the same as usual, money. Money to buy ventilators. We need to train doctors, nurses, and technicians in their use and maintenance, and in some places, additional money for things like oxygen supply. By now, most people know that ICU ventilators are very expensive machines 
with five digit price tags. But why are they so expensive? At its heart, a ventilator's job is to control pressure and flow of a gas in a tube in relation to time. That's not child's play, but it's not astrophysics either. One of the main reasons for the prohibitively high prices of ventilator is their production volume. Apple, for example, produces more than half a million iPhones per day. The world's largest car manufacturers can continue to merge and cooperate globally because parts become cheaper if you order 4 million of them instead of just 2 million. If, if you only build 10,000 cars a year, it's hard not to lose money, even if you sell them for a quarter million dollars each. Just ask Bentley. But ventilators are usually manufactured in three digit numbers per month. And they are designed for this kind of labor intensive low volume production with expensive low volume components. Even production numbers are ramped up like now when there are for example some car manufacturers that are temporarily assembling existing ventilator designs. The price per unit does not come down by much, if at all. That might be acceptable for daily use, high end ventilators sold in rich countries but we also need crisis ventilators designed for cost-optimized mass production because even industrialized countries have problems putting billions of dollars into ventilator stockpiles. And for all other countries, it's never been possible to buy enough ventilators for actual daily use, much less to prepare for crisis. The status quo is not acceptable, but it can be changed. From other projects, we're familiar with automated pressure and flow control. That came in handy during the first phase of research into ventilation. Then we looked into the feature requirements for emergency stockpile ventilators in rich countries, for ventilators for hospitals in emerging countries, and for ventilators in humanitarian crisis situations. And it became clear that the requirements were very similar, meaning that one type of crisis ventilator can cover them all. This opens up amazing opportunities to save millions of lives and billions of dollars. Remember the success story of the global smallpox eradication program 50 years ago? How about we replicate that by eradicating no ventilator available as a cause of death? How about we get back together again and make 2 million non-profit crisis ventilators tailored for their specific task? Instead of the typical low volume approach for ventilator production, we design it to be fast and easy to produce from widely available certified standard components. The technical side is actually not overly challenging. Naturally, the crisis ventilator has to be easy to use robust, and most of all versatile, and there'd be lots of options to contribute to the project, with rewards beyond the humane aspect. A simple one is that customers love companies that care, and it's proven that nothing else increases employee pride and motivation as much as a company demonstrating social responsibility and commitment. From a PR and marketing standpoint, supporting life-saving, non-profit ventilators with your engineering or manufacturing capabilities or with your quality components is hard to beat. Now, it would always be unfair to deny those benefits, all the great companies that can support Bensler production directly. But how about sponsoring a nice number of lifesavers, and in turn, grace them with your beautiful logo? That could look like this. There is a lot of idle capacity in the contract manufacturing industry that could handle the assembly of the ventilators. Our concept Leo, for example, can be built from standard components that are widely available from different manufacturers. The only custom components in Leo are eight simple injection molded enclosure parts. Everything else are off the shelf components that are used in many other products already. It should be possible to get the manufacturing costs of these ventilators to below $1,000, and that would be an absolute game changer. Cross subsidies and sponsorship can make them even more affordable for poor countries. Ventilators are class of medical devices and undergo intensive testing before they can be approved by the FDA. It's clear that every global crisis ventilator will have to comply with those standards, even if not all countries require them. The crisis ventilators would only be available to governments and aid organizations because they are the ones dealing with the health crises. In wealthier countries, the government-owned crisis ventilators wouldn't replace the regular high-end ICU ventilators like those used in daily operations or the common small units for home or mobile use, but they can vastly increase the ventilator stockpile for the next crises. They can help prevent the need for triage, and they can greatly improve the availability of early non-invasive ventilation in the treatment of patients during pandemics like COVID-19, 
to reduce the share of patients that will require invasive ventilation later on. In developing countries and humanitarian crisis areas, the experience and the networks of humanitarian organizations are perfect to ensure that ventilators are implemented and utilized as efficiently as possible, that they can start saving lives from day one. In any humanitarian project, it is crucial to consider a potential economic impact because uncoordinated donations of food, for example, can impact the livelihood of local farmers. But the regions with the most severe shortages of ventilators don't have any ventilator manufacturers, and potential regional medical distributors don't sell any significant number of them because they are just so unaffordable. So, the chance to combine saving millions of lives and billions of dollars should be a no-brainer. Everybody on our blue marble will benefit from it. Let's see if we can get going together. Your support makes a difference. You can find additional info and links in the video description below and at the end of this video. Now let's have a look at LEO, our proposal for a global crisis ventilator. Probably the most obvious feature is that LEO's enclosure is a protective case, comparable to those produced by Pelican, SKB, and other companies. LEO does not come in a case, it's its own case that has advantages for cost, simplicity, size, and robustness. LEO requires only 8 custom parts. All of these custom parts are injection molded plastic parts, and their shapes are optimized for this cheap mass production process. All but one can be produced in simple two part molds, and they integrate brackets, standoffs, and cutouts for easy and fast installation of all internal components. All other parts, from touchscreen and main switch to valves and sensors, are off the shelf components. For each component, there are several alternatives from different manufacturers available to minimize the risk of dependencies and supply shortages. The closed case is very robust, waterproof, dustproof, and can be stacked 9 units high. This way, a US standard pallet can be loaded with 81 Leos and is still lower than the 1.8 meters or 6 feet height limit of many transport companies that make storage and deployment in a crisis cheap and efficient. For emergency use, LEO can sit on the ground. It can also be placed on a desk or a side table, or be clipped onto a mobile cart. This works in one simple motion, whether the ventilator is open or closed. The cart folds or unfolds in seconds. LEO's user interface consists of a 10-inch touchscreen and 13-inch screen in the case lid. Those screens are surprisingly cheap. The two-screen setup allows users to see all values and curves on the upper screen while the touchscreen below is used to display and change settings, or to call up other information. It also makes it easy to provide context-specific information and help, and to integrate safeguards against operating error. These features are especially helpful for medical personnel that do not routinely operate a ventilator, or are new to a specific model, something that happens frequently in crisis situations. LEO is designed for a wide range of non-invasive and invasive ventilation modes, covering early intervention to ICU use. The gas cylinder unit is built up from three modules that can be arranged in five configurations. This allows for the perfect adaptation to locally available infrastructure. In LEOs, for some regions and scenarios, for example, pressure and flow control systems for pressurized medical air may not see any use, but it is a great feature for crisis ventilators in most modern hospitals so we made an optional module that can get installed where it makes sense. LEOs can be powered by 100 to 240 volts AC line power, power tool battery packs, or an auxiliary power inlet. Auxiliary power can come from a car battery, for example. This makes the ventilator as, as versatile and adaptable as possible for deployment in all regions and situations. Each battery pack can power the ventilator for up to 7 hours. The battery packs are automatically charged when LEO is connected to AC power. They can also provide backup power in the case of a power failure. The batteries are hot swappable, meaning that a battery can be taken out and replaced within seconds while the ventilator is still running off of the remaining battery or one of the other power sources. When LEOs are stored in the vital ventilator stockpile or waiting to serve in emergencies, the ventilator cases can be stacked up safely for years while the much smaller batteries are stored separately and charged every few months to stay in perfect condition. 
The battery compartment is designed with exchangeable battery interfaces and sized to accommodate batteries from many different manufacturers with different capacities and voltages. This way it's easy to set up for whatever battery type should be used. The packs here are just some examples. We'll now continue working on Leo's gas handling unit, both on getting an actual global crisis ventilator program started. Because both the possibilities of such a program, as well as the consequence of doing nothing, are just too enormous to wait around. So let's get going. You can find additional info on the website crisisvent.org in the video description below.